Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sherry Charleston, and I'm the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer here at Harvard. And it's an honor to introduce this panel, this evening event, um, and welcome you uh, to navigating classroom conversations in tumultuous times. Uh, for the past month as a campus, we've been leaning into having difficult conversations across difference and reminding ourselves, hopefully not having to remind ourselves too much, the importance of having dialogue in the midst of such polarizing times. As I share with the team, as I reflect back on my own experience in 2016, uh, teaching a gender and women's studies class the day after uh, the election, um, I wish I had the benefit of a panel of this sort of colleagues um, who could really help me think through what my plan was. Um, so thank you to all the panelists who've joined us for the day. Thank you to the Office of the Vice Provost for, advance, for Advances in Learning and the Derek Box Center for Teaching and Learning, who are co-sponsoring this event tonight with my office, the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging here at Harvard. As I said, I have the honor of introducing this panel, um, and I will um, be brief um, given the amount of accomplishment um, that is here in this all-star group. Um, so I'll just say a few quick words about each of them. Um, we have uh, Dr. Linda Chavers, who's the Austin Burr Resident Dean of Winthrop House and Assistant Dean of Harvard College and a lecturer in the Department of African and African American Studies here at Harvard. Um, Mira Levinson, um, who's a normative political philosopher who works at the intersection of civic education, youth empowerment, racial justice, and educational ethics. Um, she also is a former teacher, drawing on eight years of experience teaching in the Atlanta and Boston public schools. We have Rachel Viscomi, who's the director of the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinic and an assistant clinical professor of law. We also share an alma mater in that she has her BA from Columbia and her JD from the Harvard Law School. Uh, and then we've got Professor Timothy McCarthy, an award-winning historian, educator, and human rights activist who's taught at Harvard for 15 years. He has a joint appointment at Harvard's undergraduate honors program in history and literature, graduate school of education, and Kennedy School of Government, where, he is, where he's core faculty at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. And pulling it all together tonight um, will be our amazing moderator, Noel Lopez, who's the Assistant Director for Equity and Inclusion at the Derek Box Center for Teaching and Learning. Noel is an athlete, an artist, and a lover of ancient Greek philosophy and collaborates with all Harvard community members to create a more effective, ethical, and inclusive classroom. And honestly, I can't think of anyone better to moderate and lead this panel um, than Noel. So Noel, over to you. Thanks, Sherry. And thanks um, to all of you who are here this evening. Um, yeah, there are many things that one could be doing right now. So um, just echoing Sherry and really appreciating this uh, community and gathering of people. So just to um, get a little more time with the, the panelists, I'm hoping we can actually hear more from each of you about um, not only sort of where your position and affiliations are like within the university, but also your teaching right now and um, what that looks like for you right now. And also speaking a bit to um, why you think that it's important right now to be engaging in this conversation um, with other teachers and students alike. So um, Linda, if I could ask you to kick us off. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'll start with saying what I studied here as a way to answer that question. Um, so my, I got my PhD in African American Studies here at Harvard, and my specialty was uh, interracial literature. So I wrote my dissertation on William Faulkner and Richard Wright, and I looked at those themes that the, both men wrote about and how they apply to our everyday reality. Uh, and I say that to also say, so I always talk to students about how Donald Trump is a Faulknerian character, something that Toni Morrison also wrote about in The New Yorker a few years before she passed. Um, so to answer the question why I think it's important, for me as an educator, it's part of my pedagogy to do so. It's also part of my scholarship as a scholar. It's part of my work as a writer. So it's for, for me, it actually would be difficult to separate this. Um, there's, you can't 
you can't really talk about um, black history or black literature or the history of slavery, um, those three things without also talking about the history of democracy and the history of this country. They are all inextricably bound together. So to engage in class without talking about those things within the context of your course would be doing a disservice both to your students and to yourself in terms of your own work and scholarship. Um, I know, you know, many of my, my colleagues who teach in perhaps STEM or in ancient history like to maybe say, well, I don't, that doesn't have to do with what I study and I, what I do. It actually very much does. Uh, there's actually no, there's no field that does not intersect with the history of democracy in this country, with the history of protests in this country, with the history of people of color, history of black people, black American slavery in this country. And if you don't know that, that's okay. Just look for it, you can. Um, there, there's just no field outside of this. And so I think part of the difficulty when we say challenging conversations is we also need to recognize that and incorporate that into our thinking. Because I think to many of us kind of grew up and studied in a way that these things were all separate and needed to be treated separately, but that's no longer the case, particularly when it comes to our student body. Um, as we know, our undergraduates are much more diverse than any faculty uh, at, at this university or elsewhere. And that needs to be acknowledged and it needs to be acknowledged more and it needs to be acknowledged in the classroom. So for instance, if, if you're perhaps wanting to maybe keep a neutral, so to speak, classroom and say, you know, I don't have anything to do with that. Um, or, you know, I, I favor another kind of world and this is not my reality. Well, it is the reality of many of the students. As you know, Harvard has a, a hefty population of undocumented students and DACA students. So when we say that, no matter how you feel about immigration, if you feel that you want your students to feel included, if you say something that's flippant about elections or democracy, you might be causing psychic harm to many students that are in your classroom. They might then be more reluctant to reach out to you for any sort of help. Um, I'm not sure if I, yeah, yeah. That, that's also <laughs> that's good. That's great. Thank you so much for, for kicking us off with that. That is awesome. Um, and I'm excited to like go deeper into that too. And also for everyone's, um, there will be um, time for breakout rooms to go even deeper into some of the things that are coming out during this initial kind of like 20 minutes or so. So Mira, can you um, share a little with us next? Sure. Thanks, Noel. Um, and thank you to uh, uh, to everybody who's put this together. Um, I think, yeah, I would say, so um, as Sherry mentioned in introducing me, I, I used to be a middle school teacher for eight years. Um, and one of the things that was a um, sort of interesting and welcome discovery when I switched from teaching middle school to teaching at Harvard, because I had a rather wending way. I did my DPhil and then I became a middle school teacher and then eventually I came back into academia was that um, most of the principles of good pedagogy for middle schoolers apply pretty well to um, uh, you know, the graduate students, uh, who's the majority of who I teach these days. Um, and a few things in particular. One is, I think it's really important that we uh, remember that just as we bring our whole selves into the classroom, even if like we sometimes pretend that, you know, uh, to ourselves and to our students that we can compartmentalize, right? We are the ones who, you know, whose dog is sick or who had the argument with our partner or who is worried about our elderly parents, you know, far away who we haven't seen in a long time or whatever. And our students also bring their whole selves into the classroom, even if they pretend to themselves and us that they can compartmentalize too. Um, and, uh, you know, that's very much on display when you're teaching eighth graders, right? It's really hard for them to hide uh, who they are and what they're thinking about and um, how they're feeling. But um, it's also not healthy and it's not pedagogically useful to ask them to do that, right? Um, and so so I think partly just as a matter of um, uh, what we know about teaching and learning, um, we know that sort of humanistic teaching and learning works better, <laughs> um, that, 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 um, that teaching that engages the head and the heart and the hands um, tends to be particularly effective and also just the right thing to do. And I think we are all right now feeling um, 
distracted, divided, concerned, um, on tender hooks, et cetera. And, and that's true for our students too, no matter where in the world they are currently, because obviously right now has implications for everybody around the globe um, in many, many, many different ways. And so in part, I think it's just an acknowledgement that we are all uh, human beings in community with each other. And then I think the reason that I'm really glad that we're spending time together talking about this is because what we know again about the development of good teaching is that it's a collective practice, um, that there really is um, uh, wisdom about, I mean, there's knowledge about good pedagogy. This isn't just that you're, you know, bored and good teacher or that everybody, or that there's, it's totally an art and everybody discovers that art for themselves, right? There's stuff that we know, such as our students are likely experiencing very high cognitive load and very high emotional load right now. And so we need to be aware of that and accommodate that in our own, you know, teaching. And we know that say, uh, teaching that helps students feel acknowledged and seen and, you know, that takes where they are uh, is more effective than um, teaching that sort of ignores those features. But also we really, really know that one of the better, best ways to get, for teachers to get better is to work together in communities of practice and that these are really, really, really hard things to do. Um, and and none of us, uh, or very few of us, have um, really deep experience for how to do this in a digital space, uh, um, you know, well across time zones, um, uh, where in many cases we haven't met one another in person. So I think that be working together and sharing insights and resources and really microscopic techniques uh, can often be. Um, the difference between something that feels productive and like a, a good learning experience and community experience and one that goes uh, you know really off the rails in ways that we all regret for quite a while and find ourselves mopping up from yeah thank you for for also i feel like the echo of like the the emphasis on the holism and the 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 humane aspects of pedagogy right now between both of your answers so far um i'm wondering rachel can you can you share with us next yeah happy to um so i i teach at the law school and i run the um the dispute systems design clinical program for students and also am teaching a facilitation workshop this semester. So those two things are really informing kind of how I'm thinking about this moment. Um, and in both of those contexts, what we're really doing is trying to help students show up with their whole selves and bring themselves to situations of conflict and situations that feel really intense and to move toward it to try to learn what's the gift in the moment. What is it that the, what's the source of value within the conflict? Um, and so one of the things that that really requires and that we, we talk about and we teach a lot in the classroom is how do you be tuned into what's going on for you very much in the way that we've, we've heard about some already, um, but how do we show up for our own experience in a way that allows us to open to what's happening um, for others? And, and I will say that um, over the course of the past week, I've had the opportunity to talk to um, a lot of students who, you know, very much in the wake of the announcement at the law school that we would be online for the remainder of the year, combining with, you know, the whole soup of what's happening in the world right now, um, we're feeling very, um, very much like they needed more acknowledgement of how challenging these moments are and a real feeling that, um, you know, they, they have so many, as, as for all of us, right, there's so many layers of our experience in this moment um, and it's hard to disentangle them. So a lot of students, first year students saying like, I don't know, is this how I would be feeling if I were, you know, just a 1L, but I were on campus? Is this how I would be feeling if I were just on Zoom? Is this how I would be feeling? And to some extent, you know, one of the things we talked about is, I don't know that we need to disentangle those things because the experience that you're having is the experience that you're having. And that's what we need to, to show up for. Um, I think we sometimes have an expectation. I, for me, this is part of why it's really helpful to come together as a community of, of teachers and, and also with students, um, that things should look a certain way 
all the time. Like things should be good. We should feel good right now. And I'm not sure we should feel good right now. Right. I think um, this is a, this is a piece of what's here for us. There's a, the learning is here and it's about how do we show up to, to what's in this moment. Um, and nothing has gone wrong. Right. I mean, there are a lot of things that haven't gone the way we might like them to go um, in our classrooms, in our homes, in our communities. Um, and that's what that's what we have to work with. Right. So. Um, you know, I think a lot of what is what is helpful is thinking about how do we each individually show up with integrity? How do we help our students show up in integrity with themselves and their own experiences? Um, and how do we move toward the conflict? So those are a lot of the themes that I'm that I'm sitting with as we're here today. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, like hearing that really as an invitation around like acknowledgement and um, and working with where we are um, and how that can be like a first step for, for bridging some of the conversation. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Tim, would you share with us? Sure, glad to. First of all, uh, Noelle and everybody, thanks so much for putting this together. I'm really um, thrilled to be part of it, honored to be part of it. Also um, thrilled to see so many people interested and in here. Uh, in this conversation that, that I think says something about this community that's emerging in this time across the university and also um, says something I think about all of us um, maybe being a little bit uncertain about how to navigate these difficult times. Um, and so, so it's good to, good to have company. I want to pick up on something that, that uh, Dr. Chavers mentioned and, and I was fortunate enough earlier my my career to be in a community of practice and a teaching partner with with uh, Dean Chambers, and um, something that that she said about you know that sometimes I think it's there's a tendency to think of our of our courses like hers and like like mine, right? I teach courses on American protest literature, queer nation, politics, protest and policy in the United States, arts of communication, equity and opportunity, race and ethnicity and context story of slavery and freedom like my stuff is like all over this right and the world is all in it um and so it doesn't it's not a leap for me to figure out how to how to how to, how to put it all together because um i never compartmentalize my classroom in the world they're they're sort of part of a piece um and i think that sometimes there's a tendency to think if we don't have topics or subjects or expert expertise in a particular area that we're um that that we don't we don't have the same kind of burden or opportunity or responsibility um, to engage in these things. We'll let the folks who teach those courses do that. And I've heard a little bit of that in this time, and I think that's important to get over, frankly, because I think it's really important for us to share that burden. Because so often in times of tumult and times where the inequities and the justices and the oppressions and the violences of our society and our world are bearing down disproportionately on those who are always disproportionately burdened in those moments that those of us on the faculty and in administrative positions who represent those groups too and to whom our students uh, who may be um, underrepresented and we're underrepresented too and that we end up taking on not just the cognitive load of trying to teach that difficult material but the emotional load of trying to bear witness to our students lives and also to bear the burden of the responsibility of being there for them of being open and vulnerable and transparent and honest and also being strong and resilient and tough and fierce um, that's a lot and it's a lot when the world is bearing down on us privately and personally as well as politically and physically and psychologically and so i think this is one of those times where if you're not inclined <laughs> um, to do that generally now is the time to step up and step into that work so that we can all share uh, in that um, not just the burden but actually the opportunity which has brought at least me over 25 years of teaching um, 15 of them at the graduate schools here at harvard like an enormous amount of joy right it's changed my life and and has made me a better person and so i, I would echo so much of what my colleagues have said in terms of like this is no time for compartmentalization right this is actually a time to like to to lean into the disruption of the world right i mean we're living in a world where we live like amidst seven what i call seven perilous predicaments we're living in the middle of a public health crisis an economic crisis a racism crisis an educational crisis an environmental crisis a cultural crisis and a political crisis, like at least seven. 
perilous predicaments of the 21st century. And we're not all touched equally and in the same ways by those things, but like we're all swirling around in the midst of all of that madness. And I think that trying to figure out how we make sense of that for ourselves, what we bring to our classrooms, and then how we how we tend to our students and support them in this is really, uh, really important. I also think, um, for me, I'm a historian of social movements. And so I study literally conflict and social change. And so one of the things I constantly tell my students, and maybe this is my Marxist training at Columbia um, uh, with Manny Marable and Eric Foner and those, uh, those troublemakers, um, but I believe conflict is the engine of history. And that, that, that contention is actually the fuel of democracy. And, and when we look at times in the past and history helps um, helps me in these moments. I've been reading a lot of history of reconstruction, of civil war, of, of the 60s, World War II. Um, moments of intense conflict, at least in American history, have actually been moments where democracy in many cases has been advanced, where the rights have been achieved, where, where progress has been made. And so I am always trying to get my students and, and all of us to lean into the conflict. And it, conflict is not always the enemy. Right? Sometimes it can feel that way and the contention can feel very uncomfortable. And yet sometimes the leaps forward in terms of our history and our rights are precisely um, incubated in these crucibles. And I believe that we're in the midst of one of those now. So I actually think we should kind of lean into that. And then the last thing I would say is that, you know, using our classrooms as one of the spaces that already exist among others that we might create to invite people in and to give people space in this time to, to do what they need to do, to, 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 to kvetch, to, to heal, to, um, to be in community, to be in conflict, right? all of those things is important. And one of the things that I hope that we don't do is make too many assumptions about what students need. For instance, I've heard a lot of people saying, well, we have to be mindful of the international students because they don't, it's not, it's not their election. When in fact, my international students overwhelmingly Right, are the ones who are coming to the extra spaces I'm creating and are coming to student hours to talk to me about what's going on. Or students who, um, you know, the, the idea that, that students who are struggling, who, whose lives literally and rights are on the line, like, like all of us on this panel are at this moment, are, are gonna wanna have a pass from class, are gonna wanna not come to class, when in fact, I'm finding that a lot of the students who identify most closely with me wanna be in the classroom. They wanna be with their, with their classmates, even if they disagree with them because they've built something and they have something together. So I also wanna make sure that we're not making too many assumptions about what students need before they tell us what they need and to be really open to all of those things right now um, because I think that's how we tend to them. Again, I, I keep saying tending to them because um, I sort of feel like we're shepherds in, in, in flocks now in some ways. Yeah, thank you so much, Tim, too. I think, I think there are so many um, like themes and threads that are just emerging out of just those, those beginning like comments. So I think we'll actually turn to the breakout rooms um, uh, now so that there's a good amount of time to like go deeper into some of those. Um, I know that I am certainly still sitting with this question around what will this come like what will does that conversation look like um for for each of you when you do um go into the classroom uh tomorrow this week the rest of the semester um what does that look like um for you and also really hearing too the thread that was coming out around this is not a moment to compartmentalize and this is an invitation really to um, folks whose classes aren't even explicitly about this socio-political moment, right? This is an invitation to, to everyone um, who's teaching across different disciplines um, and really just having the site of like a teacher-student relationship, um, the site of the classroom as a space for really holding um, conversation and engagement. So um, yes, awesome. Thanks for sharing resources here too. Um, I, so I think we're going to go into the breakout rooms. Um, yeah, this will be a general prompt to go a little further into Q&A. Um, each of the panelists will be in a, a different um, room and then um, we'll have some time at the very end to kind of sh share back uh, things that come out of that. Um, in these last um, 15 minutes or so, 
um, we'll just have some time to share out from the breakout room. So I think what I'll do is um, ask the panelists from the different rooms um, if you could share uh, a couple like key like questions or themes that came up um, in your conversation. Um, and maybe I know that um, Tim had to leave, but um, to, to go teach. Uh, but I think Adam, um, Adam Beaver was going to, uh, yes. Okay. Ah, Tim, you're still here. <laughs> I, I apologize. I have to, I have to go, I have to go teach. So good luck everyone. Thank you so much. Um, so no, I'm happy to be a very poor imitation of Tim. Did you want to start with our room or? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Let's start, we'll, we can go in kind of reverse order from last time. So yeah, why don't we start sure. here? So I'm your ersatz, um, very bad Tim McCarthy, but we had a, a great group in our um, breakout room. We talked about a wide um, range of things. One of the themes that came up was uh, precisely one that had come up in our um, in the, the panel at the start, which is um, for those of us who um, aren't teaching something where it's you know quite obviously directly about the election, um, how can we um, bring it into our, our classroom or our course um, more broadly um, speaking, you know, for example, if you're teaching an elementary um, foreign language, biology, you know, something like like this, how do you open up a space in the, the classroom? Um, that might be anything from just putting aside your assigned content for the day and pointing students to resources where they can go to office hours or in other ways um, uh, make up for that content and creating a space in the classroom. It could be sending out polls. Um, some folks have been doing this, you know, kind of minute papers at the start or end of class um, all through the semester just to find out where students are, or what they'd like to talk about. Um, in some courses, maybe making kind of a plan A and a plan B, right? That if students um, want to go one direction with class, they can go that way. And if students want to um, set aside maybe the uh, kind of ordinary academic content of that, that class session, that there's a plan B for how to address it. Um, we also, on a related note, talked uh, about this question of how to find out what students um, most want us to do. Um, and that might be different if you're teaching the morning after the election versus two days after the election. It might be different if you're in a kind of larger lecture setting versus a smaller um, seminar or section um, setting. So again, what are ways of taking the temperature of polling students, of giving students the opportunity to say that they do want to um, set aside space in the classroom to talk about the election, or if maybe there's some other venue. Um, Tim uh, McCarthy pointed out that he um, tries to create a lot of ancillary opportunities in his course for um, students to talk and have contact, and it could be um, office hours, um, kind of Saturday hangouts, Friday night review sessions. Um, he pointed out this just takes a lot of time. There's no way around it. It's some of the emotional labor we do as a as instructors and not everyone you know, is able to devote the same amount of time to these things, but um, creating opportunities for students to, to do things. Um, and last but not least, just the theme that, you know, we have lots of ways to use our um, classrooms as um, spaces to help people work through um, the election. It might just be that it's a community, right? It's a space where we can come and feel that we're part of something larger and, and a group of people that is experiencing this together. It could be um, if we're teaching a journalism class um, encouraging students modifying an assignment where they can just go and uh, talk to people, right? Not necessarily um, do some hard-nosed reporting, but just use the reporter's techniques to practice talking to people in this difficult uh, time. So there are lots of ways that the skills and content we teach could be um, used to help us um, get through this time. Well, cool. thanks, Adam. Um, and Rachel, I'm wondering if you can share out um, some from your breakout room. So just um, in terms of a high level summary, we talked about a number of different things. We talked about some of the, um, the, the lack of predictability. So it's one thing to think about, you know, what, how we might try to make space on Wednesday, but not knowing what the future holds and how quickly we might have um, answers and then what the reaction to those answers might be and what the timeline is that we're looking at some of the challenges around that and thinking about this, the timeline and the ways that we show up, thinking about some of the challenges of holding space when people may have very different perspectives, ideologically, very different experiences be impacted in very different ways. Um, and so how do we make space for that? 
we talked about some of the challenges of um, figuring out how to give students the space that they need and also being mindful that we are, you know, for better or for worse, approaching the end of the semester. There are teamwork, there are ways in which students um, also are relying on each other to show up in different ways. So how do we calibrate um, with that? And then some of the balance around how do we show up in situations where um, we also have our own views, right? And we, we may have difficulty cultivating curiosity in certain moments. Our students may have difficulty cultivating curiosity in certain moments. So how do we create spaces that allow people um, to experience what's coming up for them and to acknowledge some of what people are going through without putting um, other folks at risk? And so what are some of the process uh, moves we might, we might think about? And so I think there's a huge range there that starts with, you know, potentially acknowledgement without discussion and goes all the way up to the class is now a big open discussion and there are a million um, different points in between, right? So we might think about, you know, using breakout rooms in particular ways. We might think about setting up small groups for folks who want to come together offline. We might think about a structured go round where people are sharing from their own personal experiences um, but not in a way that is inviting necessarily crosstalk or engagement if we're concerned that either the students or we might not be um, in a place where we're really able to, um, to, to hold the space in the way they might need. So I think um, being aware of both what the needs in the room are um, and the ways in which those needs might intersect and also the needs that, that you know, folks are bringing on their own. So I'll hold there. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I do believe that we're actually, um, there's, there will be a kind of document coming out of this too. So some of these like ideas and things um, talked about here will be like collected in a form to share out afterwards too, in case folks are interested in that. Um, Amira, can you share next? Sure. Uh, yeah. So um, we collected people's thoughts in the chat and one of the really common themes that came up um, was uh, the question, it was sort of two related questions. One of how open a space to create versus how facilitated uh, a class to lead. Um, and then also second, how much to um, uh, sort of elevate the sort of emotional and the current and the, you know, this is what's going on in the world and how much to elevate uh, sort of the cognitive and the academic and the content. Um, and, uh, you know, those are related to the open and the structure, but they're, they can also be quite different. And so we, uh, well, mostly I perseverated um, about sort of a, a variety of ways in which um, we can sort of balance this. I sh uh, shared a few protocols that um, I've seen that I've just put in the chat uh, that going from uh, sort of the most open of simply making space to listen to one another sort of without comment and, and response to um, you know, ways in which there are uh, protocols to say connect to content or to create small groups. We came up with um, you know, some of the same, similar uh, ideas as um, uh, Tim McCarthy's group did about Zoom polling, about sort of figuring out uh, who wants to uh, do what, where people's heads are at. We talked about creating breakout rooms that are potentially on different themes, uh, you know, people who want or, or sort of different emotional spaces, et cetera. Um, and then the question that we didn't, that we sort of started to talk about uh, and then got pulled back, and so we didn't have enough time to address was how we create space for ourselves and particularly set boundaries for ourselves in the classroom um, uh, so that we ourselves um, aren't pulled further than we can handle or uh, want to handle. And so we just started talking about sort of how we can be explicit with our own students about sort of where we're willing to go with them and where we stop. Um, and that that feels important too, important both for us and for them, because it's really helpful to our students to uh, feel as if they have clear guidelines. Um, and so they don't feel bad or as if they're violating expectations if they 
make use of us in ways that we've, you know, invited them to, but also where um, they can know, all right, you know, I, I just can't go there right now, or, or you know, she's not going to do that. Okay. Yeah, this is really, this is really awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, so far. Linda, can you um, finish us off here? Um, yeah, I'll try to. I'll try to be as brief as possible. It sounds like the breakout rooms are really, really um, excellent, and Usla gave me some tips. I, I don't think we discussed acute strategies as much as I would have liked uh, to do, but in, um, in our breakout room, we, we spoke a lot um, about the setting of norms at the beginning of your class, so that like community expectations and like I have a, a note on civility in my on my syllabus, and so I said, you know, if you have a an explicit section in your syllabus about expectations regarding mutual respect and how to communicate and so on, then when you do get to a charged issue or a set of issues, you can always rem you remind the students that that is the the where we're starting from, you know, so that those conversations can be situated in that. Um, and also, we we talked about the transparency. I, I sort of think it can connect with uh, with Mira with your breakout group that you know it's actually important um, to say you don't know, to admit you don't know, um, and to let the students hear you say that as a, something to embrace, and um, and then you can say tell the students I don't know, but I I know how to find these answers out or how how to pursue these questions. You know, I say that's what a PhD is: is that we know a lot about one thing. And we also know that we don't know a whole lot and we like the pursuit of finding out. And so kind of garnering the students and make, making everything into an intellectual exercise. So if you're teaching something like that on, the, on its surface doesn't seem like it would apply to the situation, well, let's find out how it might because um, it, it probably does. And um, yeah, so we talked about just for the sake of time, just transparency, admitting you don't know as a sign of scholarly strength that you don't know. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again to, to one and all of the panelists for really your generosity of time and um, thought and um, teaching really ongoing. And, and to everyone here, just as um, an act of uh, teaching and learning community coming together tonight. So really appreciative of that. Um, I'm sharing right now some um, further resources from the Box Center on teaching through the elections in case that's of interest to anyone. Um, I know there's been some, some great resources shared kind of throughout this as well. Um, and like I mentioned, there will be a kind of write-up um, uh, that will be shared afterwards for, for participants in the session um, as a kind of like debrief from, from various uh, breakout room notes um, and uh, the initial conversation as well. So. Yeah, thank you everyone again. Um, just uh, encouragement to, to keep turning to um, each other too, right? And so um, I hope you all have a good evening or day or wherever it is that you might be. Um, and uh, feel free again to be in touch with um, folks at the Box Center. Um, we're here as a resource throughout it as well um, as you all are to each other too. So thank you.